Greetings, and welcome back, gentles and ladies, men, to another installment of the Comprehensive Klonoa Marathon. I'm Exit Paradigm Gamer, and it's been a good long while since the Moonlight Museum video came out. I apologize for keeping you guys waiting, but now that college is done for the year, hopefully I should be able to get these videos out to you guys on a more regular basis. That being said, let's jump right into the fan favorite installment of the series, Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil for the PlayStation 2. Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil entered development sometime after the original PS1 game, and was produced by the newly minted Klonoa Works at the same time that Now Productions was developing Klonoa Moonlight Museum for the Bondi Wonderswan. Unfortunately, that's about all I was able to dig up about this game's development, except that a GameCube port was planned, but never released. Reviewers have often praised the PlayStation 2 for having one of the best launch lineups in video game history, citing such beloved classics as Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty, Jack and Daxter The Precursor Legacy, Silent Hill 2, Final Fantasy X, Eco, the list goes on. While a great lineup for a single year in gaming, most of these games didn't come out until fall of 2001, whereas the console itself launched in Japan in spring of 2000, so these games hardly qualify as launch titles at all. That's like calling Super Mario 3D World, Pikmin 3, or the Wonderful 101 launch titles for the Wii U, even though these games wouldn't come out until almost a year after the system launched. I suppose there's no clear cutoff point after which a game is or is not a launch title, but I think you you guys understand what I'm getting at here. Anyways, I bring this up because Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil actually predates the fall 2001 lineup, hitting Japanese shelves in March of 2001, whereas the likes of Jack or MGS2 wouldn't release for many months afterwards, depending on the game. My guess was that Namco hoped releasing a sequel soon after the PS2's launch would give Klonoa more exposure, and they were right. Lunatea's Veil is the highest selling Klonoa game to date, having sold 330,000 copies or so as of May 2016. While that's certainly an improvement over the first game's 180,000 copies, this modest financial success didn't translate into stronger demand for future Klonoa titles on the Game Boy Advance or even for the Wii remake. Nevertheless, Lunatea's Veil struck a chord with critics in the general public, holding a solid 91 on Metacritic. As far as I can gather, Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil is considered the best game in the series by most Klonoa fans, and often places on compilations for the most criminally overlooked titles in gaming. Everyone who's played this game seems to absolutely adore it. So what is it that makes this game so special for so many people? Let's find out. The plot to Lunatea's Veil is probably one of the best of any video game I've ever played, and it's unfortunate that I'd have to spoil both this game and Door to Phantom Isle to fully articulate why. Since many of you likely haven't played this game before, I've decided to keep things spoiler free so you can enjoy the story for yourself. Maybe I'll make a more in-depth analysis of the story sometime in the future, but for now I just want to keep the marathon moving along. One thing I should mention is that discussing Lunatea's Veil's story in itself mildly spoils Door to Phantom Isle. I won't be talking about any significant plot details from that game, but you have been warned. Our tale begins with Klonoa being transported to the dream world of Lunatea, appearing from the stormy Sea of Tears. An apprentice priestess named Lolo and her friend Popka arrive soon after and rescue Klonoa from the water. Klonoa awakens seemingly remembering only his name, and accompanies Lolo and Popka to meet the oracular Baguji, a prophet who foresaw Klonoa's arrival at the Sea of Tears, and who informs Klonoa that he's the Dream Traveler. While it's never explicitly detailed in any of the games as to what this means exactly, it seems Klonoa is a great hero who is destined to travel among the many dream worlds in his sleep to restore balance wherever it is threatened. Just as Klonoa was summoned to Phantom Isle to defeat Gaudius and Joka, or to restore the moon to the night sky by collecting its pieces in Moonlight Museum, Museum, it seems he has been summoned again to the world of Lunatea to prevent another catastrophe. Baguji informs Klonoa that spiritual balance in Lunatea is maintained by four harmony bells, which house incredible power. Through his clairvoyance, the prophet believes that a fifth bell, one of darkness and chaos, is poised to appear in Lunatea very soon, and is responsible for the gaggles of monsters which now roam across the land. Baguji instructs Klonoa and friends to visit the High Priestess of Lalakusha and journey to the first of the four bells. The High Priestess, upon learning of Baguji's prophecy, promotes Lolo to a full priestess. She then instructs Klonoa and company to ring the four bells and retrieve the bell's power, or elements, believing that this power will allow Lunatea to counteract the fifth bell. Only the combination of Klonoa was Wind Ring and Lolo's sacred powers as a priestess is capable of ringing the bells. Klonoa, Lolo, and Popka accept this destiny and make their way to the nearby Bell of Tranquility, only to be stopped by a sky pirate named Laorna in the devious tat. Laorna wishes to steal Klonoa's ring and collect the elements for her own purposes. 
When Klonoa refuses to give up the ring, he faces off with one of Leorna's monsters and emerges victorious. Leorna and Tat retreat to form a new plan, and Klonoa retrieves the first of four elements. It now falls to Klonoa, Lolo, and Popka to journey to the distant corners of Lunatea and retrieve the remaining elements, while fending off attacks from Leorna and Tat along the way. That, in a nutshell, is the plot to Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil. Vale. Much like Door to Phantom Isle and Moonlight Museum, the game has its share of twists and turns to shake things up, and I guarantee that most first-time players won't be able to guess how it ends. So what makes this plot so great, exactly? For one thing, the presentation is fantastic, and a nice step up from Door to Phantom Isle. Similar to that game, Lunatea's Veil vale features a plethora of cutscenes communicating to the player via text box. Voice acting returns, once again delivered in the fictional language of Phantom Island. Unlike the original PS1 game where the voice clips sounded like they were recorded with a potato, the Phantom Island in Lunatea's Veil vale is crystal clear and considerably more compelling than in the previous game. The characters in Lunatea's Veil vale stand out a lot more, with everyone possessing a distinct and pronounced vocal presence. Strange as it sounds, the acting has improved quite a bit as well. While they're basically speaking gibberish, the actors employ a greater emotional range than last time, so you can tell what a character is thinking or feeling based on their inflection alone. The cutscenes themselves are much more interesting than last time, thanks to the PS2's better hardware, featuring excellently animated character models and more dynamic camera angles. My only criticism of the presentation is that the cutscenes have slow pacing, particularly in the beginning. Unlike Door to Phantom Isle, where cutscenes move along at a speedy clip, Lunatea's Veil vale feels much more laid back and takes its time. While this allows for more emotional cutscenes and better acting, cutscenes can sometimes drag on for longer than I would have preferred, particularly in repeat playthroughs where you're already familiar with the exposition. The game also feels the need to make you press a button to progress dialogue boxes, which feels unnecessary when most of the text scrolls automatically to match the Phantom Island voice acting. I'd much prefer to just set the controller down and watch the cutscene, you know? Not a huge knock against Lunatea's Veil, vale, but I figured I'd mention it anyway. In addition to a solid presentation, Lunatea's Veil vale also employs a solid cast of memorable, relatable characters. While the second game doesn't have as many characters as the first one, it compensates by giving them considerably more depth. Each of the characters have their own distinct personalities, strengths, and quirks, and are enjoyable in their own ways. Lolo is a klutz with a heart of gold, Polka always speaks his mind and acts as a voice of reason for Lolo, Tat is a playful trickster, and Leorna is a calculating schemer who will do anything to get what she wants. Supporting characters like Baguji the Prophet and the High Priestess are similarly memorable in their own ways. Klonoa himself leaves much more of an impression than he did in the first game, where all he seemed to do was ask people questions for exposition's sake. He does plenty of that in this game to be sure, but we also get moments that showcase his flaws, fears, and personality, which helps to flesh him out as a protagonist. Like the last game, the plot to Lunatea's Veil vale offers something for both adults and younger children. On its surface, the story is fairly simple and easy to follow. There's an evil force on the horizon, and it's up to you to contain it and defeat those who seek to upset the balance of the world. If that's all you can or want to get out of it, you'll still be able to enjoy the story just fine. But if you have the interest and the literary know-how to dig into the theme, Themes, characters, and motifs, you'll find that underneath Klonoa 2's simple exterior lies something exceptionally complex for a platforming game. Without spoiling anything, Lunatea's Veil vale has one of the deepest plot lines and some of the heaviest themes I've personally witnessed in a video game. While Door to Phantom Isle wasn't afraid to punch you in the stomach when it needed to, it was mostly trying to be sad for sadness's sake. Lunatea's Veil vale uses its world, characters, and themes to communicate a clear, poignant moral that you'll never forget. I think that's one of the reasons why Klonoa 2 resonates with so many people. It reminds us to acknowledge a part of ourselves that we often choose to bury or ignore, and very few games succeed in doing that. Bottom line, the story is excellently presented, has a cast of great characters, and offers a surprising amount of depth. Lunatea's Veil vale has the best plotline of any Klonoa game, without a doubt, and possibly of any game in the sixth generation, at least in my personal opinion. While I can't guarantee that everyone will get into the story as much as I did, I still think you'll enjoy it for what it is. It's just one of the things that makes Klonoa 2 so damn great. Another reason to love this game is the aesthetics. Considering that Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil vale is one of the earliest releases for the PS2, this game is a visual marvel even when compared to games that would release years after. I still think that the Wii version of Dora Phantom Isle is the best looking Klonoa game to date, but Lunatea's Veil vale is still a considerable improvement over its PS1 predecessor, which was a fine looking game in its own right. The most obvious improvement is the shift from sprites to character models for Klonoa enemies and NPCs. The sprites in the last game worked quite well, 
given the hardware limitations, and while 3D models have their own drawbacks, these are some of the best looking character models to ever grace the PS2, holding up slightly better than their counterparts from the Sony platforming trio. What really helps the models to stand the test of time is the use of cell shading, with Klonoa 2 predating both Sly Cooper and the Thievius Raccoonus and The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Character designs are also rock solid, ranging from the regally reserved Leorna to the quizzically goofy Mammoth. Monsters showcase a similarly appreciable variety, with bosses offering the most creative, off-the-wall character designs in the whole game. Klonoa himself has been redesigned from door to phantom Isle, featuring lankier proportions and a new set of blue threads. This design would remain for the rest of the series, until the Wii Remake redesigned him again. The art direction is also strong, staying true to door to phantom Isle's objective of creating a world that could appear in anyone's dreams. While the character models and art design have stood the test of time, I'd say the environments are starting to show their age. To be clear, these are some creative, memorable locales, and they haven't aged considerably worse than those of most other games in the system. I I also think that the level geometry still looks pretty good for the most part, barring the occasionally jaggy asset. When it comes to texturing, however, things look a little bland and pixelated. The use of vibrant, flashy colors is something I can always get behind, but many of the textures in this game look blurry and lack detail. While I find that this is a problem with most PS2 games, it seems particularly noticeable here, especially when juxtaposed against the fantastic character models. As long as I'm discussing visual shortcomings, where's the widescreen and progressive scan? I realize that widescreen TVs weren't exactly the norm when Lunatea's Veil vale debuted in mid-2001, but the way I see it, it prevents the visuals from holding up as well as titles such as Luigi's Mansion that supported at least one of these features. But since even many high-profile PS2 games like Kingdom Hearts 2 weren't much better in that regard, I can only hold this against Lunatea's Veil vale so much. Generally, Klonoa 2 is a great-looking game and quite impressive for an early-release PS2 title. The soundtrack, by the same token, is as timeless as it gets, and is quickly becoming one of my personal favorites of any game I've ever played. Much like Door to Phantom Isle, Lunatea's Veil vale brandishes a gigantic assortment of tracks to listen to. While the tunes didn't catch in my head as quickly as the ones in Klonoa 1, with repeat playthroughs and listens, I've come to consider them superior. Although it maintains a style similar to that of the previous game, Klonoa 2 augments its tracks with a wider assortment of instruments, allowing for greater breadth. Event music does a great job of bolstering the presence of characters like Baguji or Leorna, and stage themes perfectly fit their respective visions while often defying what you'd expect from a typical platformer. In contrast with Door to Phantom Isle, where most of the boss music took the form of stylized techno, Lunatea's Veil vale elects for more genre variety while still retaining the same tension. Some of my favorite tracks in the game include the jazzy Bulk City, the syncopated Quenchless Curiosity, and the theme for one of the final levels, which I won't spoil here. Klonoa games generally have pretty good music, but Lunatea's Veil vale stands out as the best of the best in that regard, and I highly recommend checking out the soundtrack. But as always, great graphics and sound only mean so much that the gameplay isn't there, and Klonoa 2 definitely doesn't disappoint in that regard. Mechanically, things are much the same as they were before. Klonoa runs, jumps, floats with his ears, and uses his wind ring to inflate and throw enemies. The only real change in terms of control is that you can now press the shoulder buttons to pull up the HUD or to make Klonoa do a couple different taunts. Klonoa once again Again, platforms his way through a series of stages referred to as visions, occasionally squaring off with bosses or mounting his newly introduced float board. As Klonoa clears stages or retrieves elements, new visions will be unlocked in the world map. And unlike the PlayStation Door to Phantom Isle, you can revisit every stage at any time without having to beat the final boss. This makes going after side quests much more straightforward. In contrast with the first game's minimal collection of 13 visions, Klonoa 2 offers a more impressive count of 22 normal visions, including boss fights. While this sounds great, a handful of these visions are actually repeat visits of previous stages with additional stage hazards and new enemies. For example, long after making your way up the temples of Wallakusha in the beginning of the game, you'll have to revisit them while battling new enemies and grappling with the poison gas gimmick. The addition of new set pieces and enemies to these levels changes the way you play them enough to the point that I don't really mind the repetition that much. The game also does a good job justifying these revisits story-wise, so it never feels like padding. Still, I would have appreciated it if the developers had created more original stages instead of repeating existing ones. Even with the added levels, Lunatea's Veil vale can still be beaten in about 6 hours or so, about twice the length of the previous game. Like Door to Phantom Isle, Lunatea's Veil vale is expertly paced, so while it's not as long as most games on the system, it does avoid needless fluff or padding while also managing to outlast its predecessor. 
The level design is both a step forward and a step back from the previous game. Compared to most modern platforming games, which are quick to rehash the same volcanoes and deserts we've seen a million times before, Klonoa 2 injects some much appreciated originality into its environments. During his journey to ring the four bells, Klonoa will scale monastic cliff sides, fly around in an amusement park, and make his way through a trippy, gravity-defying maze of smoke and mirrors. Each vision introduces its own unique set pieces to stand out from the rest, which helps to keep things from getting stale. One way the level design has been improved from the previous game is in its use of puzzle elements. While still not as pronounced as in the handheld titles, progression in Lunatea's Veil certainly requires a lot more thought than in Door to Phantom Isle. This has a lot to do with the introduction of two new enemies. Herbals allow Klonoa to electrically dash upwards while double jumping, while Lakuris act as something of a key for these crystal barriers you'll periodically come across. These new enemies, along with the returning boomies and ketons, go a long way in diversifying and intensifying the puzzle gameplay from last time. I think the puzzles are at their best in the Maze of Memories, which combines an understated gravity gimmick with a series of tricky enemy swapping puzzles. It also manages to offer a more non-linear level design without feeling too labyrinthine. Where the level design falls flat concerns stage length. As I've said in my reviews of Yoshi's Island and Sonic Heroes, there does exist a point where levels become too long and the game starts to drag. This is where Lunatea's Veil drops the ball. While the first few visions can be beaten in under 10 minutes, the remainder go on for about 15 to 20 minutes a pop, with 26 minutes being the longest I ever spent in a stage. The Ishra's Arc stage, for example, tasks you with finding and activating three engines to get the ship moving again. Even when I knew what I was doing, it took me almost 25 minutes to clear the vision, which I'm not a huge fan of, to be perfectly honest. Now, I was still able to power through these stages and still really enjoy myself, which is more than I can say about Team Dark and Sonic Heroes. I also understand that the developers wanted to make sure that players got their 50 bucks worth by creating girthier stages than last time. For these reasons, I'm willing to tolerate the extended stage length. But if you're someone who hates playing levels longer than 10 minutes under any circumstance, you might want to skip out on playing Lunatea's Veil. Overall, I find that the improvements to the level design outweigh the increased length, but I still think Door to Phantom Isle was better at making sure stages didn't overstay their welcome. One aspect where this game has unequivocally improved on the last one is in regards to the difficulty. Both versions of Door to Phantom Isle gave you an unnecessarily beefy health bar that made it very hard for players to die against enemies or bosses. Moonlight Museum took things in a new direction by shrinking your life meter from 6 hearts to 3, which I felt was for the best. Now, enemies actually pose something of a threat, so you can't just bum rush your way through stages. At the same time, the game's not so unforgiving that you can't afford to take a hit once in a while. The level design has also become much more difficult in general, and later levels feature some tricky but manageable platforming sections. When compared to Door to Phantom Isle's bosses and Moonlight Museum's lack thereof, Lunatea's Veil has a much more enjoyable selection of boss fights, and possibly the best of the entire series. Just as Klonoa's health bar has been halved to force the player to take enemies more seriously, boss health bars have been doubled to make them more imposing. Similar to the last game, bosses will develop new attack patterns as the battles go on, keeping you on your toes while maintaining the same basic weakness. While early bosses are still pretty easy, they manage to put up more of a fight than Rongo Lango or Gelg Bomb, and the later ones will give you a run for your money while not being annoying. Lunatea's Veil also gradually ramps up its challenge at a comfortable pace as you get farther along, as all good games should. From a difficulty perspective, I consider Lunatea's Veil a sizable improvement over its predecessors. Over the course of the game, Klonoa will unlock a floatboard that he can use to traverse water slides and mountainous cliff sides. There are only a select few visions in the game that use this mechanic, which feels about right. There's enough of the floatboard here to justify the mechanic's inclusion and to showcase a full range of difficulty, but not so much that it will put off those who wish the whole game was just the regular puzzle platforming. Much like Klonoa's base moveset, the controls for the floatboard are fairly simple. You can speed up or slow down by pushing in the requisite direction, you can jump to cross pits or to reach airborne collectibles, and you can pick up enemies for use as an attack or for a double jump. Along the way, Klonoa will have to dodge obstacles and jump over pits while making his way to the end. Honestly, there's not much else to say about the floatboard. It's just simple platforming fun, and these stages help to avoid fatigue with the main gameplay. My only nitpick is that the floatboard feels a tad slippery in the forward-facing sections, but that's really the worst I can say about it. As always, if the main gameplay isn't enough to whet your appetite, Lunoa 2 offers a spate of extras and side quests. Lunatea's Veil introduces the Moment House, where you can face off against previously fought bosses in time attack mode and access a range of other unlockables. To unlock more content, 
in the Mommet house, Klonoa will have to collect certain objects in the main visions. Introduced here are Mommet's memory dolls, magical toys with the ability to collect memories. Apparently, these dolls left Mommet to collect memories in the main visions, but were fragile and broke apart. To recover them, Klonoa will have to collect the six memory bells in each stage to reassemble the dolls. The Mommet doll side quest is essentially this game's equivalent of the captured Phantom Islands from Door to Phantom Isle, and honestly, I've gotta give the point to the first game for this one. For most of the levels, finding Mommet dolls is just as enjoyable as finding the Phantom Islands in the first game. As always, I appreciate it when games give me an incentive to poke around stages and fully digest the level design. My issue with this side quest doesn't concern the dolls themselves, but rather the longer stage length. The underlying problem is that many of the memory bells are hidden in Nagapoko eggs in this game, and since many of them are invisible, or just contain objects other than memory bells, it can be easy to miss a bell by accident. Now, normally I don't mind revisiting stages to find collectibles I missed the first time through, but when I miss an object in a stage that takes over 20 minutes to clear, my attitude starts to change. The last thing I want to do after spending 20 minutes clearing the Ishwa's Ark is to do it all over again, only to discover that the bell I was missing was at the beginning of the stage. And of course, you're not allowed to just grab what you missed and leave. You have to beat the stage again. I did have to revisit a few stages to save all the Phantom Islands in the first Klonoa game, but in that game the stages were short enough that I never minded it. The good news is that you don't have to find all of Mamet's dolls to start unlocking things. If you can recover half of them, Mamet will open the first of two extra visions for you. Which isn't anything super special, if I'm being honest. It's very short and not that challenging. But clearing that stage will unlock a sound test with some of the game's music. If you can find all of the memory dolls, Mama will open the second extra vision. This one reminds me a lot more of Baloo's Tower, going on for much longer than the first extra vision and featuring some tricky platforming sections. Clearing this stage will unlock the remaining songs in the sound test. While the second extra vision is a pretty good optional level, I can't say it's worth having to replay 20 minute levels so you can find the obscure memory bells you missed. I recommend full completion of the side quest to completionists and hardcore Klonoa fans only. The other side quest involves Dreamstones, the little green and blue gems floating around in every vision. For every stage that you manage to collect the maximum of 150 stones, you'll unlock a picture in the scrapbook at the Mommet House. Moonlight Museum and Dream Champ Tournament had a similar side quest. Both versions of Door to Phantom Isle also had a side quest like this, with green dreamstone icons on the world map denoting the levels where you located 150 stones. But as far as I know, you don't get anything for doing it besides bragging rights, and I didn't even notice this feature was in the game until after recording Lunatea's Veil. While I did bother to collect all the dreamstones in Moonlight Museum, Empire of Dreams, and Dream Champ Tournament, I can't be arsed to find them all in this game even with the scrapbook images, which truly do look really nice. The problem, once again, is that the stages are just too long to make it worthwhile. There are exactly 150 stones, so if you miss even one and can't go back, then tough shit. You either have to kill yourself to go to the last checkpoint, or restart the stage. And unlike the portable games, there's no option to just restart the room you're in. But even that wouldn't be so bad if it wasn't for these stupid mirror fairies. These guys are essentially power-ups that double the value of nearby dreamstones for a very short period of time. And while you'd think that these wouldn't be required to reach 150 stones, you would be wrong. You better haul ass when you turn these things on, because if you miss even one of the nearby dreamstones, then you're not going to make the quota by the end of the stage. While I was able to unlock a few pages in the scrapbook, after a while I just gave up because it wasn't worth the hassle. Overall, while Lunatea's Veil is good about rewarding you for doing side quests, the side quests themselves are too much of a pain in the ass to be worth it. That basically wraps up my thoughts on Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil. While it's not going to be a perfect experience for everyone, I do understand why most people consider it the best Klonoa game to date. The story offers a cast of colorful characters in unique settings, employs surprisingly deep themes and motifs, and wraps everything up with a relatively original message that most games wouldn't dare touch. Although the texturing of the environments can look a little dated by today's standards, Klonoa 2 is still a great looking PS2 game, featuring strong creative art design and some of the best looking character models on the system. The soundtrack offers a fantastic assortment of tunes, and while they're not immediately memorable, they're among the best that the series has to offer. The gameplay is also a considerable improvement over Door to Phantom Isle overall, featuring more visions to play, stronger puzzle elements, harder bosses, a new mechanic, and a better challenge. My biggest complaint concerns the excessive length of many of the stages, but even that isn't a huge deal so long as you skip out on the side quests, which I don't recommend playing anyway. Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil deserves all the praise it gets, and perhaps even more for its perfect balance of story, gameplay, and presentation. If what you've seen in this review interests you, then I can't recommend this game enough. 
While I do think you'll appreciate the story more if you play Door to Phantom Isle before playing this game, I think anyone with the proper interest can pick up Lunatea's Veil and enjoy it just fine. The only potential barrier is the price, which has ballooned considerably since I bought my copy for 8 bucks in 2013. Getting this game with a case and manual is going to ring you about $45, which is a bit pricey for a PS2 game that you can beat in 6 hours. It's about $20 cheaper without those things, but I personally never buy a disc-based game without them. If you ask me, the game's worth the price of admission, but ultimately that's up to you. Since Sony has begun re-releasing PS2 games on the PlayStation 4, I wouldn't be surprised if Lunatea's Veil ended up in PSN someday. Bandai Namco has been pretty good so far about re-releasing Klonoa games on digital download services, so I think there's a good chance it might happen. While Klonoa 2 Lunatea's Veil is an excellent gem for the PlayStation 2 library, it's not my personal favorite game in the series, which we have yet to look at. Next up in the comprehensive Pluto Marathon is a two-for-one special. I'll be looking at both of the GBA follow-ups to Moonlight Museum, those being Pluto Empire of Dreams and Pluto 2 Dream Champ Tournament. I look forward to sharing my thoughts on these titles, hopefully within the next couple of weeks. Until then, I'm Exa Paradigm Gamer, and I hope you all enjoyed the review. So interesting. 